Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show with Dr. Robert Lufkin. How can we combine internal medicine and naturopathic medicine for health and longevity? Dr. Peter Moran at Longevity Healthcare Center has over 30 years of experience providing care to patients in a variety of settings. His philosophy is to blend internal medicine and naturopathic medicine to provide a functional medicine approach that looks for the root cause, which can be the source of many conditions. He received his medical degree from the University of Tomnamath, uh, Guadalajara. Before we begin, I would like to mention that this show is separate from my teaching and research roles at the medical school, which, with I, which, which I'm currently affiliated. It is part of my continuing effort to bring quality, evidence-based information about health and longevity to the general public. Now, please enjoy this interview with Dr. Peter Moran. Hey, Pete, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate being invited to be a part of the show. Well, yeah, your, your approach to healthcare is fascinating. I, I love it. Combining internal medicine with naturopathic medicine to create a sort of a functional medicine approach. And, and be, I can certainly relate to the internal medicine part because uh, in, in my medical training, I started out in that, in that specialty uh, many years ago. But, but before we dive into that, Maybe we could just step back and you could tell our audience uh, how you came to be interested in this fascinating area. Well, you know, it, it all kind of starts at the beginning at the university level for me, because at that time, I really was unsure of where I was going in life, as most young men and women are. And so I decided to go into chemistry and mechanical engineering. So I'm basically a foundation of a chemist and an engineer who now goes to medical school and the curiosity doesn't stop there. So I find out that now I'm doing, you know, more of a rotating internship. I'm in uh, dealing with emergency medicine. I'm dealing with OBGYN surgery. And I kind of graph myself into a more of a geriatric internal medicine type of practice. Yet what had occurred is that I became the practitioner for one of the large senior centers. And these people were on just a whole list of medications and nothing was working. So I became more of an, using a naturopathic approach, looking at more of the metabolic pathways, looking more at the various hormonal systems, trying to understand how I could get past that barrier of what we call a leaky gut or get past that barrier of not absorbing properly the nutrients that you needed, which opened up the back in the mid 90s, opened up the use of intravenous therapies. So this whole self, uh, segued into what became known as functional medicine and functional medicine is basically looking at the cellular level, trying to see what kind of an effect can you have on what we call the person's environment or the epigenetics of the genes that can actually make things work a little bit better for them. So you don't need all these medications, which apparently were not working for all the people that are dealing with. Oh, for, for sure. So, so internal medicine, naturopathic medicine and functional medicine, they, they really overlap in, in, in certain ways um, and, and share these common themes, uh, maybe like you say about metabolic pathways and, the, and epigenetics. How do, how do they differ? How, how, what's the difference between internal medicine and naturopathic medicine and functional medicine? Well, I would say that uh, to, to work with the understanding of uh, internal medicine, it's like the ologies of medicine, you know, you have cardiology, you have gastroenterology, you have pulmonology, you know, you're looking at the renal system. They've actually separated everything into different systems. And that's how most what we would call allopathic, which are what uh, MDs and uh, the various uh, DOs will practice is that, uh, that type of systematic medicine. But what the natural uh, paths were able to bring into the, the order of things is that everything is interrelated. 
and that it's interrelated at a metabolic level or it's interrelated on you know lifestyle on what you eat and how you can take care of yourself whether or not you're sleeping properly whether or not the gi tract is assimilating as they say properly so there's all these different nodes of the matrix which functional medicine was able to actually lay out there's like 15 different nodes that were are able to work together to strengthen all of the cellular growth or the cellular communication and that's what was so uh, put aside which is now being brought out more in everyday medicine and everyday health because we are now looking at you know people who are taking care of themselves rather than uh you know a perfect for instance uh, of this is the COVID situation now the reason why i'm just briefly bringing this up is that we found out that COVID in itself uh dealt a lot with people who had uh generalized weakness in the respiratory or the gi tract or the cardiovascular but you notice that when COVID started there are more people eating properly and exercising than I had ever witnessed before, because the message came down the line, especially uh, I'm in uh, California, Southern California, where people are actually able to get out and exercise and feel that strength and, and empower themselves so as not to contract this uh, nasty virus. Yeah, that, that's such an important message. Uh... Yeah, and, and, and going back, my background is uh, also in traditional medicine uh, with my MD degree. And I, I still remember in medical school in the, the first few decades of my career, uh, learning about dementia and Alzheimer's as one disease, and then uh, strokes as another disease, and heart attacks as another disease, and cancer as another disease, and diabetes as another disease. And maybe maybe we began to understand that strokes and heart attacks were related through the blood vessels, et cetera. But now I think it's, it's, it, it's been a revolution in the understanding to think that, that diabetes and dementia and cancer, at least many forms of cancer, are all linked by, by these fundamental metabolic inflammatory conditions uh, that can be influenced by, by our diet. And it, so it's, it's almost the traditional medicine is coming towards the naturopathic and functional medicine state. Uh, some would say not, not quickly enough or not fast enough because uh, a lot of people a lot of uh, experts in the field still uh, don't quite accept all this or acknowledge all this as, as much as as much as they should. Um, what what do you think they agree on and what do they disagree on and what what needs to change in these areas? I, you know, I really uh, I think that a lot of uh, science and medical thought are all going in the same direction. And what that is, is that there is an underlying inflammatory process that is provoked and it's provoked by our environment. Uh, to give a simple example of this, you know, I kind of call it the canary in the mine. Um, if you take a look at the uh, graph of uh, Roundup uh, and how Roundup was just brought into the environment about maybe 30 years ago, and that the graph just has a certain a certain curvature to it, or a slope you might call. And then you maybe put hey in, Pete, tell tell our audience uh, specifically what round Roundup is, and so they'll they'll know they may not be familiar very, with this it's drug. It's an glyphosate. It's an herbicide, and what it does is that it actually is put on sprayed on vegetables and things like that so, so that that the uh the weeds don't interfere with the growth of the of the vegetable or the fruit the interesting part is that they can't get it out of the system but what roundup did is that it was introduced into our gi tract 
And when it was introduced into our GI tract, we didn't have a direct a toxic effect to Roundup, but Roundup itself actually uh, killed off our natural biome. So what we naturally have in our gut that protects us, you know, there's like, what is this? It's some uh, crazy number. It's like 300 trillion bacterial cells and there's three, uh, 30,000 trillion uh, human cells that make up the body. So we are actually a, a carrier for all of this bacteria. So what Roundup did is that it actually knocked off or killed the natural biome, which form what we call short chain fatty acids, which is food for the brain and food for the other parts of the body. And it actually went ahead and uh, by doing that, it led to an inflammatory process. Now we know that in the use of Roundup or glyphosate, you'll actually see these graphs. And if you were to put up um, Parkinson's disease, it follows the same graph as it does autism. So really in my understanding, autism is an intrauterine uh, disease that occurs. It's, it's like the canvas is all set up from the use of these various um, chemicals that we're seeing from the outside having a direct influence. And if, for instance, we know that the, uh, a woman's umbilical cord blood has 80% higher chance of the uh, mercury level that she's carrying. And that is actually going right in through the placenta. So these are the things that we are actually seeing that are influencing us as what we call the antecedent stage of fetal growth. And it is, uh, it's an inflammatory process that has uh, overtaken a lot of what we're seeing. We're seeing the direct relationship between uh, the uh, use of substance use disorders, which cause anxiety and depression. We're seeing it again with the various neurological diseases with Alzheimer's disease. And the idea is that Dr. Brell, Dale Bredesen came up with a brilliant uh, protocol in managing the major parts of what causes, not only causes Alzheimer's, he's actually shown and we're actually doing it to where we're actually able to stop the Alzheimer's deterioration and regress to where the brain is regenerating on itself. Wow. So, yeah, that's that's remarkable. Yeah, Dale Bredesen will be in a future episode on our program, and we're really looking forward to talking to him and hearing about it, this. So this this inflammation, I guess, before we leave uh, glyphosates and mercury, uh, just take home tips for for patients. Glyphosates, they can minimize that with organic foods. Is that the best approach you'd use? That's um, the best approach. It is basically working with organic food and. And that includes, uh, you know, meats and fish and things like that are also something that need to be on the a food list. I mean, we do gain a lot of nutrients from that. So uh, I hate to say that, but farm-raised fish is uh, is very much out there. But you also want to make sure whether or not they're using organic feed for the fish, organic feed for the animals. And these are all because everything plays a part of it. You know, the, the ecosystem has become so, so delicate. So it's any, any, any uh, vegetables and fruit that we consume should be organic. And then the, any meat products, we should make sure that the, the feed that they can, the meat animals consumed would, would be organic too, because the glyphosate can move up the food chain, right? Uh, from it, that. It's just like if you're in a uh, if you're in a market and you're to buy swordfish, you'll actually see a sign about pregnant women eating swordfish because of mercury levels, yeah. because they are a higher in the food chain and the mercury levels have have risen. You know that's that's the process. Yeah, and so the for the mercury avoidance is mainly the the fish certain the certain types of fish are the main sources that we need to avoid. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Oh. So so all these things contribute to to inflammation, and 
What exactly do you mean by inflammation? What, what is inflammation in kind of a, a, a layman's term? In layman's term, the best way to put on inflammation is that let's, let's say that I'm going to use an analogy, and I'm just coming up with this analogy now, so if it's kind of off base. <laughs> but let's say that you, you look at your finger and you, you notice that there's a little red spot. And you can't notice it, you can't figure it out too well. So you put on your glasses and you look underneath a light. And now what you see is that there's something that's interfering in the area where that red spot is that is causing the body to react. And it's reacting beyond what one would normally expect. You know, if you touch it, it hurts, it's red. Uh, you know, there's some uh, white stuff coming from it, like an infection. You know, these are all signs of inflammation. So let's go ahead and use that analogy in a different manner. So let's say that somebody has sensitivities to certain foods. Now, what they do is that they'll eat those foods and all of a sudden they get bloating, they get belching, they, the things, foods are not just being absorbed properly. So rather than uh, the food that you eat being broken down and assimilated and going through the tract where now you have nutrition, it becomes more of a, a, a food that's, an, that's causing direct problem within the lining of the gut to where now you get more of a uh, what we call the wrong bacteria growing around this food. And that is an inflammatory process in of itself. And that inflammatory process, what it does is that now it triggers uh, the immune system to produce more of what we call, a lot of people have heard about the pro-inflammatory cytokines. We heard about it during COVID. Well, now we're producing these pro-inflammatory cytokines now, these pro-inflammatory cytokines are not just regional to the stomach. It's being signaling in the stomach, but it's going throughout the whole body. So all of a sudden, you know, someone will have something that, oh, you know, I ate that, but now my sinuses are draining, or I ate that, now I feel a little headachy. You know, you're actually feeling the, the communication of the immune system that is uh, signaling this inflammatory response throughout the whole body. Oh, interesting. In the, um, yeah, I, I remember with uh, APOE4, anytime there's APOE4, which of course is the, um, the, the type of allele that um, increases our risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and anytime there's a, a a disease or a gene that persists in the population, it's always asked, what is the possible survival advantage for this gene? Why, you know, why doesn't, it, if it's, if it's only bad news, why doesn't it uh, get eventually uh, through evolution lost? And uh, I've heard the explanation with APOE4 that it actually is a pro-inflammatory gene and it it makes the brain much more inflammatory, which is a disadvantage in causing Alzheimer's disease today. But in earlier times when humans were exposed to parasites in the brain, it actually was a survival advantage because the brain uh, would react and become inflamed with parasites and, and knock them out. It's, it's an interesting idea, but today certainly, inflammation is is uh does much more harm than than good although i guess with everything it's a balance um uh so i guess when when you're talking about the bad kind of inflammation it's really chronic uh low-grade inflammation uh that builds up in our bodies correct yes you know you brought up a very interesting point with the apoe and uh, what has occurred as our understanding and the evolution of understanding the, uh, the genetics, we now are actually seeing various uh, situations to where somebody might have, instead of what we used to call big B, big B, and big B, little B, that they will have the big B and little B and that they can actually trigger 
the uh, what we call the variant or the environment trigger the variant and that variant in itself can trigger more of an inflammatory response. So we're seeing the genetics play a lot more important factors than we're actually able to work with within that. And that's where I talk about the epigenetics. It's the environment that we're putting our genes in. And it's actually able to work within that to go ahead and to you go back to what is considered more of the wild type or the healthy type. Mm. So there is so much uh, involved in what, uh, what we're able to do to settle these things down. And again, I, I, I refer to uh, autism as the canaries in the mind because children, you know, 30 years ago, autism was one in less than 10,000. And now it's less than one in 50. And it's just amazing, amazing disease process that has occurred to our children. Yes, that's, that's really remarkable. Well, to, to decrease inflammation, um, avoiding the uh, pesticides, uh, avoiding mercury, um, you mentioned uh, the gut also protecting that. What other things can individuals do to decrease their inflammation to improve their health? Well, you know, a lot of, uh, like I had mentioned with the, you know, people just kind of picked it up naturally. What they did is that they started exercising. They started exercising. They started drinking filtered water. Uh, they started to stress reduce, you know, through meditations or through spiritual. And it's all of these things that we have been able to just kind of calm ourselves down and listen to our bodies, which are things that we could do naturally, which will go ahead and reduce the inflammatory process. And these are the things that will go ahead and, you know, if you feel like uh, it's, so, it's, uh, it's so direct that if you eat something and you feel like, well, I should have eaten that, you're right. You probably shouldn't have eaten that. <laughs> Maybe you should write that down on the list, things that I shouldn't eat. And then if you eat something and all of a sudden you feel energetic, you know, you, you're eating some like carrots or something that's all colorful, salads, and, and you feel good and everything is moving and you don't need that Prilosec or you don't need that H2 blocker because the food's not going south. Now, you know, that is one of the biggest kicks I get out of this whole thing is that people have a history of gastroreflux disease. And they tell me, well, I need something to block the acid in my stomach. And I go, well, well wait a minute, uh, you need that acid. That acid is what's going to break down the protein, break down the fat. That's what's going to help get rid of if you have excess yeast in your belly and the bad guys. Why don't we do this? Why don't we get the GI tract to where it's moving rather than trying to stop the acid? Let's move it because maybe the problem lies is that things need to go south instead of north. And when you're going north, it's because of the acidity and, and you're not breaking things down properly. So I'll put somebody on something so simple as uh, magnesium citrate, which is great for the muscles because it you know, reduces spasm. And then, so they're now they're taking magnesium citrate, drinking some water, and things are, you know, you're not getting diarrhea, things are starting to move. And the next thing you know, they're now using digestive enzymes, which once you know it, it has bentane HCL, it has acid in it. And they're going, God, I start to feel great, you know, and my, I'm digesting, my enzymes are digesting. These are the simple things that people could start to interact with their whole natural body that will just strengthen them. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of the things that's always fascinated me was um, about, about stress, let's say. We know that chronic stress is bad. You know, it, it activates uh, cortisol and does a lot of bad things to our body. Yet, on the other, time, on the other hand, we see things like um, acute stress, like ice, ice baths or uh, hot saunas or even physical exercise is sort of an acute stress on the body. But um, it was interesting to me to to understand that that 
that there were really two forms of stress and one stress, the chronic stress that never goes away is very damaging to our bodies and causes all sorts of disease manifest many ways. Whereas acute stress can actually be beneficial and activate um, you know, hormesis or uh, can activate certain survival and longevity genes uh, and, and all. So I, I'm wondering, do you think there's a similar situation with inflammation? Is there, is like chronic inflammation bad, but are there, are there good kinds of inflammation that is short-term acute or is that a different model with inflammation? You know, it's a very interesting thing that you should bring that up is that uh, one thing that has shown longevity is fasting. So if someone was able to get into more almost like a, a ketogenic type of diet towards the end of the day or you know at the hours where they sleep, they're actually regenerating blood, you know, brain cells. They're actually helping to turn off that inflammation, which as you brought out is so detrimental. And everything just kind of settles down. And it allows the body to, you know, they, you know, there are a lot of different, uh, you know, spiritual sex that actually do do fasting and they do it and it's healthy and it's written about. So I think that you're absolutely right. You know, there is the ability to bring in these various sectors of living to where you're actually getting rid of the chronicity of something. It is a chronicity where you're actually getting the arthritic joints. It's not something that you just have joint pain for a minute. It's that you have it for a long period of time that causes that distortion. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And, and about the fasting too, it's, it's, it's probably, probably maybe the only thing that all the great religions of the world agree on that fasting is good for us. And, and it, it's, it's funny in this, in this particular uh, summit interview series, um, almost all the people I've spoken to that are experts in health and longevity uh, advocate fasting or intermittent feeding to the extent that, you know, their patients can tolerate it as a way of improving their health. It's, it's one thing that everybody's agreeing on more and more. <laughs> I know it's such a simple idea, isn't it? You, you know, and and when you see it, it, it has uh, so, yeah tremendous effects on the gut, tremendous effects on the brain and on the whole organ systems. You, you know, another interesting part is that we uh, uh, glanced on it briefly. Uh, how cholesterol cholesterol in itself doesn't cause cardiovascular disease. What causes cardiovascular disease? is that when that cholesterol, that low density lipid is inflamed by an inflammatory process and that inflamed low density lipid gets behind the lining of the artery and now it can't get out and what we call macrophages, you know, big eaters, they come and they start chewing on that stuff and they start growing the plaque. That's where the problem lies. It's, this is not the cholesterol itself. The idea is that no, you can't eat Krispy Kreme donuts and think that you're going to get away with it. You can't have these sugar levels. And it's so easy to go ahead and to make those changes. And, you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, you could do it. You know, and I remember I worked with a large um, Hispanic or other populations that just loved you know, greasy food, and they just love their corn tortillas, and their blood pressures were through the ceiling, they were on all types of medications, and I started working with them, and basically said, hey, why don't we just stop grains, they go, no, I can't do that, and no sugar, they go, oh, no, and no dairy, and they, you know, they, they took the challenge. I said, just do it for two weeks. They took the challenge. They'd come back and their blood pressure was dropping. Their cholesterol was dropping. We were able to reduce their medications. The diabetes was clearing. And then they would all come back with a smile in a month or two. And I go, how you doing? They said, we're doing great. Wow, wow. I, that's uh, that's such, it's such an important concept that both both grains and 
and sugars and refined carbohydrates can can cause inflammation. What's the mechanism for that? How do they how do they cause inflammation or what's the how does that happen? Let's let's work with brains. What happened is that someone came up with this brilliant idea after the war that we we're going to feed the nation. So they came up with a uh, they used a, a long grain that was genetically modified so many times that it's unrecognizable. And the thing is that they never looked at the nutrition of it. They never looked at the nutrition. All that they knew is that they could grow up fastly and had a long shelf life. And what those grains do is that when they're ground into powder, they readily convert over to sugar. So that's the basis in sugar itself. You know, it's an interesting part about sugar is that there were studies done on uh, these children that would eat sugar cane. And if you ever saw these natural, you know, the, the children in Hawaii or in various like Fiji that are just chewing on the sugar cane, their teeth are white, they're strong, there's no signs of bacteria. Yet if you use... Uh, something like high density corn syrup, you just have all of this decay that goes with it. Oh, interesting. For the for the grains, uh, some people uh, are concerned about the gluten also uh, with gut health. Is is that something that you uh, advise against, or is it mostly just the grains converting to the the sugars and carbohydrates? Well, I think you bring out a really good point. And, and that is, is that, you know, you're looking at an inflammatory process that's occurring in the gut. And uh, it is not only part of gluten, but again, we have genetically modified those grains to where they're unrecognizable by the body. Hmm. So I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's a grouping of a lot of different pieces that come in with this profile. And again, I think that the easiest way for someone to determine if they're having trouble with this is that especially your various forms of uh, pasta, that people don't think pasta is a grain, but you know, it's your similia, which is your people don't get, you know, the true similia that comes out of Italy, there's less problems with this gluten factor and this genetic factor than what we do see here in other parts. And then soy, you know, soy in itself can also be problematic. So there's a lot of different foods that if, uh, you know, the old saying, keep it uh, simple and sweet, you know, kiss, that you basically are able to uh, uh, obtain nourishment that is not actually inflammatory for the body. And if you think about what you're eating and whether or not it's rather than just trying to fill your stomach, to where you feel full, if you eat something and you think about it, your body will tell you whether or not if this is good for me or not. And this is something that you know can go forward in helping to assimilate a healthy body. Yeah, uh, inflammation is so uh, so common. Who would have thought that brushing our teeth would be associated not only with uh, uh, getting rid of dental caries, but also minimizing our risk for heart disease, as you say, in the blood vessels there, and 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 even even dementia. You mentioned a dramatic response in your in your practice about um, hypertension and uh, responding to to inflammation that way. What other types of diseases uh, do you find reducing inflammation valuable for in in your patients? You know, uh, I deal with a large group of population that deals with uh, substance use disorder. And what happens, which has really, really became a very interesting part of my practice, is that um, substance use disorder is a coping mechanism for anxiety and depression. So when you're moving more, more into working with an inflammatory process, you're actually working with a change in the neurotransmitters, which are now becoming more inflammatory and also leading to depression. So what we do 
is that we will try to form a coping mechanism so as not to have the anxiety and the depression. And it so turns out that those coping mechanisms, unfortunately, turn out to be addictive. So we now have formed an addiction to the coping mechanism for anxiety and depression. Yet if we were able to just remove certain pieces or add certain pieces, we would not develop, again, the inflammatory response, which uh, leads to anxiety or the inflammatory response, which leads to the overproduction of cortisol, which is trying to manage for that inflammation, but rather we could calm things down in a natural method. And that's where this is really is really an interesting profile. So improving the inflammation uh, allows these individuals to better manage their substance abuse or addiction. Is, is that right? Exactly. Because they don't, they're no longer managing the anxiety and the depression. Ah, ah. So you, you help them by managing their lifestyle to reduce the inflammation and then, and then in addition, helping them with their substance abuse, but uh, find that combined to be a very effective uh, method. Is that right? Exactly. So now that you have someone who would go ahead and let's say they're using a substance as a coping mechanism, rather they're out there uh, jogging or they're playing basketball with the kids or they're, you know, something like this is occurring, which is now decreasing an inflammatory process. You're increasing increased health. And it's a, it's a natural coping mechanism of dealing with stress. Wow. Wow. And, and uh, part of your practice focuses specifically on this area, correct? It does. A lot of my practice is moving more into working with the work of uh, Del Bredesen with the Alzheimer's disease, working more where I could, I work with someone who let's say is drinking a fifth of vodka a day for 10 years. I'm able to deactivate that within a day or two. And then by using the, what we're talking about here, go ahead and work with the epigenetics, work with the various genes, bring things back to a normal state to where someone will be sitting there within a day, they'll just, you know, it's like the lights are on in somebody's home and wow. they don't want that anymore. They want, they don't want to go back to where they were because now they're actually thinking they've recollected their personal lives. If patients want to access your program, uh, do you, uh, do they need to be in a certain location or is it available by telemedicine? Uh, what, what, what sort of patients uh, are, are able to access what you do? They can access it both through telemedicine. The best way in this treatment, this is not a treatment protocol where you have to sign up for 30 days or 60 days to be institutionalized. No, this is really a kind of a, almost an outpatient type of profiling. But you also, you know, one thing about addiction, addiction is both biological, which is the medical sector, which we deal with, but you also have the psychological, which developed into this coping mechanism, and you have the sociological, birds of a feather. So you need people that are going to support them. So the group that I work with uh, usually are the families and the loved ones are there supporting, saying, hey, you know, you got to do something. We, we love you. We're here supporting you. And they'll support. And that's really where it is. So you don't really need this 30-day inmate type of profiling where you lose your income, you lose your job, you lose your family. That's not, you know, that's kind of tough. One of the other speakers uh, for this summit uh, for this series is Joan Iflin, who uh, specializes in uh, addiction for processed foods, addiction, and, and, uh, uh, and, and looks at patients overcoming their need for processed foods. Do you, I know your practice is more focused on alcohol and substance abuse. Uh, do, do you see uh, processed food uh, people at this time? 
You know, I think what she, that is excellent with what she's talking about because it is so right on that the processed food in itself is an inflammatory stimulator. And people really look at trying to get that kick, but they could get the same kick through a natural, uh, a natural mechanism. I think what she's doing is fantastic. I'm looking forward to hearing her work. Yeah, yeah. She she tells a great story that the tobacco industry, when it was effectively being being shut down or or decreased in size, they pivoted and purchased large processed food manufacturers. The, the whose names were all familiar. And then they used the same delivery channels the way they delivered cigarettes, you know, in fast food stores to deliver <laughs> high, basically uh, they just switched the addiction from tobacco to, uh, to processed foods. But the great thing about processed foods is you can sell to children and you, you have a much bigger market because it's not controlled at all, essentially, like tobacco was. So it's been a, been a rebirth for these industries now. <laughs> so, uh, oh, gosh, I, what a, she hit the nail on the head with, uh, you know, distributing this to children as far as the various colors, you know, the flavors and everything, synthetic this and synthetic that. I mean, it is such an incredible industry to a group of, to little ones that, you know, are completely unaware. Yeah, and she even went through some examples of, of uh, how they marketed like Marlboro cigarettes, certain packaging, certain colors, and then the same, the same company began marketing processed foods to children, but they, they showing examples, they look very much like the same packaging for the Marlboros, you know, and they work, you know, the same way just by stimulating your brain and everything, but <laughs> that was... That was very interesting. But in, in your practice, then uh, you, patients can come essentially via telemedicine from anywhere in the world. They just go to the website to sign up then, correct? They do. I, I'm, I'm really open as far as talking with people about this. Uh, the actual, uh, you know, the actual dealing with the addiction, they might have to come to the office a few times to actually uh, work with that. Uh, but that's no burden. I mean, you know, I would I work with a lot of professionals, a lot of executives who are just have a lot at risk. And they're just so grateful that this opportunity is available for them. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, knowing, knowing what you know about your, your deep expertise about infl inflammation and sort of wise choices in lifestyle to what how does this inform your own personal choices if you if you wouldn't mind speaking about it uh, what what decisions do you make for your for your lifestyle choices to improve your health and longevity and, and decrease your inflammation let me give you a brief and i'm going to keep it really brief story of myself i'm the biggest guinea pig that i have ever met in 1990 i was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and they wanted to take my whole colon out. I changed with exactly what we're talking about as far as got rid of the grains, the sugar, and the dairy. I was able to do well until 2011, where I had a three-way bypass. I had 100% blockage of the left main, uh, which is considered you know, the widow's maker. And then, uh, Two, what was it? And then in 14, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And again, they wanted to take my colon. I don't know why they wanted, didn't even want to give me a semicolon. Everyone wanted to take my whole colon. Out. And again, I went back into this process that I am able, because I can now interact, interact with people of what's going on. And then, of course, after having so many surgeries and things like that, you know, I think I lost some of my piano lessons along the way from the anesthesia <laughs> and other things that were going on. So I actually recognized the uh, genetics, the epigenetics in myself. And this is where I started now uh, being able to follow what I am discussing with people. And, you know, that was in 14 when the, or 15 when the surgery, so six years um, I don't have any source signed of cancer or anything. 
So I've come quite a ways myself with listening to like going, wait a minute, I don't want to go through what is going to be offered here. So wow. those are the changes. Wow. So what is your what is your diet look like or your exercise regimen? I exercise, unfortunately, I just came down with COVID and I'm bouncing out of it quickly, thank goodness. Wow. <laughs> but that's all right. And, you know, I, I have something on COVID on the website of how people can work with the vitamin D, the, the quercetin and the C and, um, and the various parts. But basically what I do is that I will go ahead and do a cardiovascular uh, two to three times a week. And that includes riding a bicycle or being able to be in the water. I deal with uh, working out with weights uh, twice a week. And then I try to keep myself in a meditative stress, you know, uh, reduction environment. You know, you can't completely, not in medicine, can you completely remove yourself, but at least you'll find uh, pathways or segues of getting some kind of relief. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry about your COVID. I hope, hope that that passes uneventfully for you. Oh, it's, it's working. I'm, I'm out of it. I'm out of it. Now I'm trying to figure out how am I going to deal with, uh, I already dealt with Delta. Now how am I going to deal with Lama? Uh, you know, it's just working with the very variants that are coming through. There's not much uh, you could do that other than take care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and metabolic health and decreased inflammation improves your, your chance with it at all as well. Yeah. How about um, your diet? Are you fasting uh, other than the uh, pesticides and mercury? Are there other, uh, other things you avoid in your diet? You know, my diet is basically that of uh, a paleolithic, ketogenic in the evening time kind of diet. I do stay away from grains. I found that grains had been a big factor. Uh, I used to love lattes. I don't, use, I don't drink any kind of milk or cheese or anything because I find that, that that is problematic for me. So I, I just kind of stay away from it and I don't have problems. So it's, uh, I'm kind of like walking the talk, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, that, uh, it's, that's so powerful, that common recurring theme of ketogenic diets and, and or ketogenic lifestyle choices. I, I remember hearing more and more of that. Any nutrients or supplements that you, you take on a regular basis? Yes, I do. I do uh, take on a regular basis things like CoQ10. I do work with alpha-lipoic and N-acetylcysteine. It uh, helps the brain, keeps the mitochondria, crosses the blood brain barrier. I work with, uh, you know, a lot of the, the fish oils I get, I actually, you know, get fish, you know, cold water fish. So that's really where those are coming from. Uh, let's see, vitamin C, of course, is a mainstay for me. You know, the buffered vitamin C to where it's like two grams twice a day. I, I use digestive enzymes uh, and I work with various, you know, it's what's come up a lot is that the mycotoxins in the environments have been dealing a lot with mycotoxins with a lot of patients. So what happened is that it, uh, I needed to find out what type of uh, probiotics would actually go ahead and break down the mycotoxins. So the various probiotics in and of themselves, they produce something that break down the toxins, which is really interesting. And then of course, I work with things that will go ahead and uh, help remove the ver various biofilms that could be forming in one sinuses or in the GI tracts. Uh, these are the type of uh, things that I work with. Wow. Wow. Well, whatever you're doing, keep it up because you, you look great. <laughs> it's, it's doing a good job. Very, very kind of you. How can our audience uh, find you on social media, or maybe you could uh, tell us your the name of your website, tell our audience so they could go sure. to it? Um, right now, our website uh, is undergoing some, some work, and the name of the website is longevityhealthcare.com. And uh, if uh, you'd want, you know, I have all of that information available for you. Uh, in there, I have a glossary which talks a little bit about what we're talking about. 
uh, just so to, to, you know, bring awareness and, you know, I'm open to questions and things like that. We'll be doing podcasts, uh, becoming more informative, especially with various ways to manage the inflammation and to reduce stress. Yes, let keep me posted too, and and let me know when you're when you launch your new podcast, and we'll we'll make it available to uh, the the audience here as well. But thank you thank, so much, Ron. Yeah, thanks so much, Pete, for taking uh, time to talk with us today. It was it was really wonderful to spend an hour with you and get to know you a little bit more and learn about your practice and the uh, exciting things that you're doing with inflammation. Well, I, I, as you can see that there's a passion, you know, it, this whole thing had uh, developed from something where, you know, working with medicine and trying to understand it. And then all of a sudden seeing such results occurring, not only with myself, but with other people. I mean, I, I cannot tell you all the, the gratitude that, uh, that is received and it's just what keeps you going. It's really fun stuff. Yeah, this is such an exciting time to be in medicine. I mean, I've always loved loved medicine my whole career, but I have to say it's never been more exciting now with the possibilities that we can take control of our lives through these lifestyle changes to, to increase our health and longevity. It's such a great time to be in this space. I, I do want to put a plug in for the Institutional Functional Medicine. I think that uh, they have really led the way in many ways. Great. And we'll, we'll include a link to that also on the, on the show notes if people want to find out more about that and get involved. So again, thanks. Thanks, Pete. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. I do too. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be on your show. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you next time.